20. We're on a WebEx teleconference meeting. I will call to order the Brainerd City Council meeting and we will start with roll call. Uh, Ted Erickson. Here. Lambert. Here. Stumix. Present. Here. Here. Johnson. Here. And Bedeau. Here. Excellent. That brings us to Can you skip Evans. Yes. Bevins. Yeah. Yeah. He got angry and went home. <laughs> I joined the Baxter City Council. So, so uh, just in defense, I covered up Wayne's name so that I would not call him during roll call until after he took the oath, and I accidentally covered up Bev Bevins in, in addition. My fault. My wife does that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we got Bevin's presence. We'll move next to the next item, which is item number three, administer the oath of office to Alderman Ward 3, Wayne Erickson. All right. Mr. Erickson, if you would please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Wayne Erickson, to solemnly swear to solemnly swear that I will support the constitution support the constitution of the United States United States the constitution of the state of Minnesota constitution of the state of Minnesota and that I will faithfully discharge the duties will faithfully discharge the duties of the Office of City Council Ward 3. Of the City Council Ward 3. Of the City of Brainerd, Minnesota. Brainerd, Minnesota. To the best of my judgment and ability. Judgment and my ability. So help me God. So help me God. Well, welcome Wayne. We're back to a full Council, so Mayor, you could just leave now. We won't be having any tie votes today. Next up is item number four, approval of the agenda. So moved, Bridget. Second, Bevins. Motion, Bridget. Second, Bevins to approve the agenda as presented. Any discussion? Seeing none, we'll vote by roll call. Erickson. Yes. Lambert. Yes. Stunick. Richard. Richard. Yes. Wayne Erickson. Yes. Evans. Yes. And Johnson. Yes. That motion carries. We'll move on to the consent calendar. Notice to public, all matters listed are considered routine by the council and will all be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless good cause is shown prior to the time the council votes on the motion to be adopted by roll call. Lambert, so moved to accept. Second. Second. We've got a motion from Lambert and a second from Bevins to adopt the consent calendar by roll call. Any discussion? Seeing none, we'll vote by roll call. Ted Erickson. Yes. Lambert. Yes. Stunick. Yes. Richard. Yes. Dean Erickson. Yes. Bevins. Yes. And Johnson. Yes, and that motion carries. That brings us to item number six on the agenda, which is community member of the month. We actually did need you here, Mayor Bedeau. Take it away. Yeah, actually, um, I'm gonna let David Chansky uh, present this here. And I believe that uh, Connie has a video for us as well. Do we want to do the video first? 
Well, why don't we, why don't we uh, explain what the video is before this? Yep, I can do that, Mr. Mayor. Um, and I'll let the President Johnson, if you want to step in at any point as well, as this was your nominee. Um, so as as you, the council knows, Community Member of the Month, we started that last year. We haven't gotten many recently. Um, however, uh, Tina J uh, was was nominated um, at, for the Community Member of the Month Award for her social distancing dance party, which she held on Monday, April 27th. And we do have a little clip of that party that we can play, Sean. Looks like they're all doing the robot. It was a lot smoother when it was just three of us in here. Connie, you're muted. Connie, you're muted. Get the Johnson family back here. <laughs> I could play it all night, but we probably need to get some business done. <laughs> yeah, so I just want to say super fast that, um, you know, when we first talked about bringing this program into place, this is exactly the type of thing we were looking for. It's not about the huge uh, things that people do for their community. It's about the little things that people do every day to help their neighbors and to help those around them. And I'm so glad that Councilman Johnson was uh, able to live across the street from this when it happened, because this is exactly what we're looking for from our community of the month members. So we want to thank Tina J. I know she wasn't here, able to be here tonight, um, but we want to thank her and just encourage everyone that's out there uh, to nominate your neighbors for this sort of thing, because this is exactly what we're looking for. We want to celebrate the small improvements that people are making in the community's lives. Mr. Chair, Pritchett, is that or will that be posted on the city website? The dance itself. I believe the city administrator got permission from the uh, copyright owner of the video to post it. So, so it may end up there. <laughs> I did. I asked the the woman who posted it if she would give us permission to share it, and she did give me written permission that she would. Excellent. And thanks, Mayor Bedeau, for uh, recognizing Tina. I've lived next door to Tina and Mike J since I bought this house 14, 15 years ago. And I would say almost every month they could be recognized as an outstanding neighbor in some way, whether it's shoveling snow in the winter or, or any number of things. So they're just great neighbors to have. That brings us to the next item on our agenda, which is Council Committee Reports. We'll start with the Personnel and Finance Committee, Alderman Pritchett. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have five items on our agenda and we'll jump right into it. Item number one is payment of bills. Um, you know, the only interesting thing on there, there are a lot of payments to people who had leased parking spots and we had decided to give them back their money. So um, our motion is to basically uh, authorize payment of bills as presented and I so move. And I second it, Stuart. Motion by Pritchett, a second by Stunick. Any discussion on the bills? Seeing none, we'll vote by roll. T. Erickson. Yes. Lambert? Yes. Stunick? Yes. Pritchett? Yes. W. Erickson? Uh, yes. And Johnson? Yes, that motion carries. Alderman Pritchett. All right, our second item is the additional general liability policy. Um, Finance Director Hillman, if you wanna give us a little bit of information on this. And take it from here. All right, at our last council meeting, um, we had our in, local agents from Weisinger Ingle with us and they presented the policy for the March 1st, 2020 to February 28th, 2021 policy renewal. At that time, they, offered that or made it known that the city council could purchase an additional million dollar excess liability coverage 
for an annual pre premium of about $35,600. At that time, council decided not to take additional or to take action on the additional coverage as we wanted to talk, discuss to BPU. Um, in this packet was information provided by our local agents on what the um, additional rider, rider would cover. Um, and it was found on page two of the attachment to the agenda request. Um, we had a couple of questions that were not able to be answered before the packet went out, such as what is meant by downstream liability for the dam? And what could be an example of this? And this would provide coverage for um, if a, a dike or a levee or something burst downstream and it was due to the operation of our hydro dam. Um, there are 11 cities or 11 members from the League of Minnesota cities that do purchase this downstream liability, um, but they have not been any losses to date. Another thing is, has the city ever had a claim that wasn't covered by the statutory limits? The city of Brainerd has not had any claims that have not been covered by the tort limit. However, there's been several examples in the previous years dealing with um, police officer shootings, that kind of stuff that have been in excess of the coverage and would not be covered by the tort coverage that we currently have. Another question we have was how many cities our size purchases purchase this additional policy? And um, we were told by Weisinger Ingle that there are approximately 61 cities that are in the same population as Brainerd between that 10 and $25,000. And a little less than half of those members purchase the additional coverage. Staff did discuss with BPU. Um, they did not think that we needed to purchase the additional policy at this time. And so staff's recommendation would be not to purchase the additional rider for the March 1st, 2020 through February 28th, 2021 insurance policy since the rider was not budgeted for 2020. And then we could discuss it again when we are working on the 2021 budget. So if council decides that we can have this be a budgeted expense. Any other questions or concerns? Dave, you there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Did something happen? <laughs> Nothing happening. Right. So the motion coming out of committee um, in looking at this, um, we thought it was intriguing, but we didn't really think that we wanted to go with it this year because we didn't budget for it. So the, the motion would be uh, to not purchase the additional rider for March 1st, 2020 February, to February 28th, 2021, the insurance policy, since the additional rider was not budgeted in 2020. Staff would like, and then also motion that uh, in the same motion that staff would like council to discuss the rider again for the March 1st, 2021 through February 28th, 2022 policy year during the 2021 budget process. And I so move. Second. We have a motion by Pritchett and a second by Erickson. Discussion on the uh, additional general liability insurance policy. Seeing none, I just kind of want to ask Corky. We're not going to need the additional liability this year, are we? <laughs> Any other discussion? Hearing none, we'll vote by roll call. T. Erickson. Yes. Lambert. Yes. Stunick. Yes. Pritchett. Yes. W. Erickson. Yes. Evans. Yes. Johnson. Yes, that motion carries. Alderman Pritchett. All right, that takes us to item three, which is the building inspector promotion. Um, and so basically what, so what's coming out of committee is the recommendation of promoting Jason Stockinger uh, to be placed on step six. And the reasoning for that is we cannot, we have to place him to the closest step without reducing um, his wage. Um, and so uh, that would he would need to, in order to go in another step, he would have to get two achieves expectations and one exceeds expectations to go to step seven. However, he would be receiving colas. Uh, just a little more, more background. There were nine applicants uh, for the position, five of whom were qualified. Uh, and then as of right now, uh, they're not looking at backfilling the position for a few months. They want to review visit that in July because they believe that uh, with the BS and A software. It's saving time and they might not have to backfill it. So we're actually could see some budget savings from, you know, some expenditures earlier. Um, so uh, did I cover everything, Mr. Chansky? All right, 
So the motion is to approve the promotion of Jason Stockinger to building inspector at step six of the building inspector wage schedule. And I so move. Student. I have a motion by Pritchett, a second by Stunick. Look at great job, Alderman Pritchett. Your first uh, meeting as PNF chair, and you're already saving us. <laughs> Any other discussion? Seeing none, we'll vote by roll call. T. Erickson. Yes. Lambert. Yes. Stunick. Yes. Pritchett. Yes. W. Erickson. Yes. K. Bevins, yes. And Johnson. That motion carries. Alderman Pritchett. All right, that takes us to item number four, which is to select a broker to assist with the 2021 health insurance proposals. And I'll let uh, HR Director Schubert kind of handle this one. Sounds good. Good evening. So, as many of you are aware, our health insurance over the last five years that they have increased almost 50 percent just to give you an idea on that um, for many years we had some of the lowest rates in the source well pool we currently now are some of the highest rates in order to be financially responsible a core group of the city bpu and hra management team was formed and we recommended that we do a market check on our health insurance plans as well as our rates to see if they're competitive and what we should do um, in reviewing our options, we reviewed what a couple other entities have done, specifically the League of Minnesota Cities, as well as the City of Marshall. Um, we knew, or I knew, that both entities had recently done this type of market review. And when I contacted them, they informed me that they actually utilized a broker to do this process for them. Health insurance is very complex. It isn't that we can just compare apples to apples. There are several different types of plans. There's union plans. We also have something called PEEP in Minnesota. All those different things are hard to compare. And so that's why they utilize a broker and that is what we are asking for. Um, we had sent out a request for proposals for a broker to assist us in this process. Uh, we sent it out to four brokers. Three of them were recommended by John Oaks from Integrity Benefits. Integrity helps us with our ancillary benefits, and he knew that these brokers have helped other public entities in the last couple years. We also sent it to our current broker, RG or Strong Insurance as well, to see how that would come in. All four of them submitted um, their RFPs. As we reviewed them being the management team, um, our team unanimously recommended retaining North Risk Partners to assist us in this process. Although they are not the lowest bid, the team felt the risk, North Risk Partners proposal was the most comprehensive. It appears that they had the most experience performing this type of review. Their fees were one of the lowest costs submitted. And we also appreciate that they have a local office as well. And that local office is Klein and Fleming. Um, a couple things to note, they did offer two options with their proposal. One was for the one-time fee um, for 6,000. They also offered a second proposal as well. And that alternate was if we wanted to utilize their services for a full-time broker going forward. At this point, staff is not recommending to do a full-time broker, but if we decide to do it, they would allocate that $6,000 towards their 2021 fee. Um, I also felt it was important to clarify a little bit of what our current broker does and why we pay them. Um, Strong Insurance, they have helped us for over 30 years. Um, they currently help us primarily with helping with open enrollment um, if employees have questions about our health plans or if they have issues throughout the year. And it kind of um, also helps when an employee leaves to help them understand their insurance options. So that is um, the basic information. Um, again, staff's recommendation is to utilize North Risk Partners for a 2021 health insurance RFP process. Basically, in a, in a nutshell, um, we kind of want to test the waters in health insurance because the rates have always been going up. And staff feels that that the type of language that's used in a lot of these is outside their area of expertise, which is one of the reasons why we want to look at, a, at the broker. And I, I do have a motion if, if we're ready. Yeah. All right. 
The motion is to approve uh, retaining North Risk Partners as broker to assist with our 2021 health insurance request for proposals process in the amount of $6,000 from the general fund, general unallocated professional services. Is that right? Yep. Um, with a cost split between the city BPU and HRA based on the number of full-time employees in ISO. Second. We have a motion by Pritchett, a second by Tad. I have one question. So 6,000 is the total contract contract price he would be paying a portion of the six thousand out of the city's unallocated service fund yeah. 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 Our cost the city's cost would be about three thousand we're about half of the employees okay any other discussion seeing none we'll vote by roll call t erickson lambert yes stunick yes Pritchett. Yes. W. Erickson. Yes. Bevins. Yes. And Johnson. Yes. That motion carries. I'll call them in Pritchett. All right. That takes us to our last item, the Minnesota State Investment Funds one time uh, exception. Well, it's actually the one time exception revisited. Um, last August, we looked at this and it was decided to revisit in the spring of 2020. Uh, if you guys can remember, uh, we retained 100, approximately 174,000 last year and returned 43,000. Um, now, in looking at it, the state says that we had, would receive an additional $6,581.54. And of that, we could retain uh, $5,265.23. So, um, the motion from staff is basically to author or the motion from the committee is to authorize staff uh, to proceed with the renewed opportunity to utilize the one time except exception from Minnesota uh, from the state myth fund balance and use those uh, as we have the other ones to promote economic development, especially in in lieu, you know, with the COVID crisis and I so move. And I second it, Stunick. We have a motion by Pritchett, a second by Stunick to utilize the one-time exception for a second time. Is there any decision? <laughs> <laughs> Seeing no discussion, we'll vote by roll call. T. Erickson. Yes. Lambert. Yes. Stunick. Yes. Pritchett. Yes. W. Erickson. Yes. Evans. Yes. Johnson. Yes, that motion carries. End of report. Thank you, Alderman Pritchett. That brings us to Safety and Public Works Committee. Alderman Bevins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We also have five items, but it will only seem like two compared to that lengthy PNF meeting. First item is the first item is the bi uh, biannual bridge safety inspection proposals the motion is to accept staff's recommendation approving the proposal from bolton and make in the proposed cost not to exceed twenty four hundred dollars in iso move second erickson accepted we have a motion by bevins a second by erickson any discussion mr chair this comes from construction fund 401 any other discussion or questions Seeing none, hearing none, we'll vote by roll call. T. Erickson? Yes. Lambert? Yes. Stunick? Yes. Pritchett? Yes. W. Erickson? Bevins? Yes. Johnson? Yes, that motion carries. Alderman Bevins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Next up is the contract towing services. The motion is to accept staff's recommendation enter into an agreement, a two-year agreement, authorizing signatures on the agreement document with Collins Brothers Towing of Brainerd and Isomo. Lambert, second. A motion by Bevins, a second by Lambert. Any discussion? Mr. Chair? Yep. Just that you can see, if you scroll down one page, you'll see Engineer Sandy's put a side-by-side -side comparison, and you'll see Collins Brothers is significantly less expensive. Uh, one clarification, they're not of Brainerd, which, um, you know, they're from the other guys. 
And I, if, I wish that there was any way we could pick a local business that we would, but the price difference is too significant. Any other discussion on the motion to go with Collins Brothers towing? Vote by roll call. T. Erickson. Yes. Lambert? Yes. Stunick? Yes. Pritchett? Yes. W. Erickson? Yes. Bevins? Yes. And Johnson? Yes, that motion carries. Alderman Bevins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Item number three is the cross jurisdictional maintenance agreement with Crow Wing County. The motion is to accept staff's recommendation, approve the attached maintenance agreement with Crow Wing County, and authorize the proper signatures on the agreement document. And I so move. Erickson, second. A motion by Bevins, a second by Erickson. Any discussion? Mr. Chair. This is simply where there's a number of roads, uh, short pieces of roads, that it makes more sense for us to do some of them, even though they're county roads, and the county does their maintenance on some of the city roads, uh, basically based on geography and cost savings. Um, we actually end up with about three tenths of a mile of road that we that we win on, but it makes purely economic sense to take care of the roads where we fit geographically. Okay, any other discussion? Seeing none, we'll vote by roll call. T. Erickson? Yes. Lambert? Yes. Stunick? Yes. Richard? Yes. W. Erickson? Yes. Bevins? Yes. And Johnson? Yes, that motion carries. Alderman Bevins. Thank you. Item number four is improvement 20-01, the 2020 seal code project authorization to bid. And the motion is to accept staff's recommendation authorizing advertisement for bids for the 2020 seal code project with bids to be received and opened on Friday, June 5th, 2020 at 10 a.m. in the city council chambers at City Hall and I so move. Lambert second. A motion by Bevins and a second by Lambert. Any discussion? Mr. Chair, just on the dollars and cents, we normally budget $150,000 for this project. As you can see, the engineer's estimate is $170,000. However, we expect um, budgeting or I mean proposals to come in um, where we've teamed up with. Um, is this the one where we team up with the county, Mr. Sandy? We expect estimates to come in closer to the 150, and if we have to, we can drop streets off the thing rather than scramble to try and add streets when the bids are coming under budget. Thank you. Any discussion? Paul, you should have purchased a bunch of oil when they were paying us like $40 a barrel for your street projects. You <laughs> saved us money for years. Seeing no other comments, we'll vote by roll call. T. Erickson? Yes. Lambert? Yes. Stunick? Yes. Pritchett? Yes. W. Erickson? Yes. Bevins? Yes. And Johnson? Yes, motion carries. Alderman Bevins. Our final, our final uh, agenda item is the downtown landscaping contract revised quotes. We asked Community Development Director Chansky to go back and talk to the bidders. And the motion is to direct staff to contract with Copper Creek Landscaping for downtown landscaping services in the amount of $6,177. And I so move. Erickson, second. We have a motion and a second to award the contract. Is there any discussion? Evans. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. This is roughly $10,000 under what they have originally bid. Uh, the cost is fully assessed to downtown property owners. And thanks to David Chansky for going back for a second. So, thank you. Excellent. Any other discussion? 
Seeing none, we'll vote by roll call. T. Erickson? Yes. Lambert? Yes. Stunick? Yes. Hatchett? Yes. W. Erickson? Bevins? Yes. And Johnson? Yes, that motion carries. End of report. Uh, good job, Alderman Bevins. That seemed like three, three and a half, I think. <laughs> Unfinished business. 8A committee recommendations recommended by Mayor Dave Widow. Yes, you have all been waiting for me to speak, and I am here. Uh, <laughs> first of all, we have, I have a recommendation of Dan Hegstead to the Cable TV Advisory Committee. Uh, Dan Hegstead is a perfect fit for that group with his background, so that is my recommendation for that group. Dan Hegstead to the Cable TV Advisory Committee. Richard, so moved. Second, Bevin. Second. We got a motion by Pritchett, a second by Bevins to affirm the recommendation. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, we'll vote by roll call. T. Erickson? Yes. Lambert? Yes. Stunick? Pritchett? Yes. W. Erickson? Yes. Bevins? Yes. And Johnson? Yes. Motion carries. Eight. Moving on to 8B, call for applicants, Mayor Bedeau. All right, so obviously applicants applications are available at City Hall on our website, so you can find them there. There are plenty of uh, wonderful things that you can get involved in here at the city. But what we are currently looking for, Cable TV Advisory Committee, although we just filled a slot for that, we are looking for two terms expiring in 2021 and 2022. The Charter Commission, uh, two terms expiring 2020, one expiring in 2021 and one term expiring 2022, excuse me, and another term expiring in 2023. A lot of terms expiring at a lot of different times on that one. Uh, and then we also, those, those all expire at the end of the year each year. This is a doozy and a beautiful one. The Economic Develop Development Authority, we have one term expiring on the 7th of September of year 2020. And now stop me if you've heard this, but the reason why we do that is because that's when uh, that group was formed way back in the day. Uh, we're also looking for a uh, members for the water tower committee as well. Thank you, mayor. That brings us to 8C city hall and police department remodel projects update. Paul, probably. Yeah, that's me, Mr. President. Thank you. Um, I think Kevin was dialing in right now as we speak. Um, while he does that, um, he project. Um, we do have something we would like to discuss with the city council um, that is in the agenda request. Um, with the chances that uh, social distancing practices will have to continue for some time. Um, after the pandemic, uh, staff feels that it's probably prudent to um, look at installation of temporary or permanent glass barriers to protect staff and the public from close interactions at the front counters um, on second and third floor. Uh, before the meeting, we uh, went in to Gully Glass and asked for uh, some quotes, uh, either for a temporary plexiglass barrier that can be removed or a permanent glass barrier uh, that could be present uh, at all times, even after the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, staff's interpretation of this is that while a temporary barrier is a little bit cheaper, the permanent barrier also assists with some security issues with staff behind the counter. Um, with the window open right now, uh, there isn't a barrier for people to jump over the counter. And so there is that portion of that while protecting during flu or potential for COVID-19 outbreaks, uh, the barrier also helps with the security standpoint um, after we have the card readers and everything installed um, and obviously allowing for proper social distancing once we all return to work. And so from that perspective, uh, we would uh, recommend that the installation of the permanent glass barrier on second and third floor uh, for a total cost of $1,586. Um, and then I hope that Kevin during this time is called in. I guess the council can discuss that first. Yeah, Paul, I'm, uh, I joined. All right, welcome, welcome, Kevin. 
we'll uh i think we'll handle this this plexiglass glass decision first if pritchett you have a motion i have a motion to uh, move to approve the purchase and installation of the permanent glass fixtures lambert second we have a motion by Pritchett, a second by Lambert to go with the just under sixteen hundred dollar option to have the permanent glass at the at the counter instead of temporary glass. Is there any discussion? I have a question. Pros and cons of temporary versus permanent. Uh, I can answer that if I may, Mr. President. Yeah, please do, Paul. The plexiglass a lot of times has a lot of uh, characteristics uh, that's hard. It's hard to keep clean in a lot of circumstances um, from what I've heard. Um, so that is one thing. Uh, the permanent glass also, the, the, the pros to that is that um, security of staff behind the counter. Um, even if the doors are locked, um, someone I'm not could sure still- I'm not sure how far but I will tell her to there, pull over someone for you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and I, I think the uh, I'd add another con of the permanent glass is it's a it's a physical barrier between the government and the citizens, and it's kind of it's unfortunate. I don't like dealing with people behind glass. I I, I like more personal interactions, but given it's it's a thousand dollar difference, and we'll probably be social distancing for at least a year or two, if not longer. Might as well go with the the professional looking options. I always think plexiglass looks a little tacky. Any other thoughts, Bridget? Always looks like you want to push somebody into the boards with the plexiglass. Um, I was just, I was going to say too that we can't look into the future, but this is something that, like you said, we might be doing for a couple of years easy. So, Mr. Chair, and I think it's this is Lambert. Yep. I would think it'd be better to be proactive on on this issue for the same reasons you guys have suggested so I think I agree too I'd rather see pe people face to face but hopefully they'll do a little bit better on what we're seeing now in these temporaries that it won't be so awkward so thank you thank any you. other any other thoughts on the motion to go with the permanent sixteen hundred dollar solution Seeing none, we'll vote by roll call. T. Erickson? Yes. Lambert? Yes. Stunick? Yes. Pritchett? Yes. W. Erickson? Yes. Bevins? Bevins? Yes. And Johnson? Yes, that motion carries. Uh, okay, back to Paul or Kevin. Um, Another update? Go ahead, Kevin. Okay, uh, this is Kevin Curry with Contegrity Group. Uh, with an update on the project, I'll start with City Hall. Um, we completed the third floor office area uh, remodel. Um, on Friday, we did a punch list. Uh, today, the space was cleaned and City will start moving into it tomorrow. Um, also ongoing at City Hall is work in the boiler room, replacing the physical plant equipment there. Um, I believe this week they're also trying to start up the air handling equipment, uh, the cooling system that's on the roof um, of the garage area and get the uh, Air handling units that are in the ceiling of all the office spaces on all the floors uh, up and running. So we'll have the heating and cooling capacity, I believe, at the end of this week or the first part of next week. Uh, and that system's kind of separate from the unit that's going up in the penthouse uh, and the new boiler. It has heating and cooling capacity without the boiler and the fresh air system up above. Um, work continues in the Northeast stair area. We're painting in there this week and uh, we'll be putting the flooring down uh, soon after that. And um, we also will be starting the renovation of the council chambers after uh, we move out of that 
area tomorrow. Uh, we can start that demo later this week. Uh, the demo in there is limited to the flooring uh, and the light fixtures. Uh, otherwise, we'll be just doing new paint, new flooring, some wood trim, uh, associated um, audio visual uh, upgrades, and uh, that would be it in that space. So that space will be uh, work in there will go fairly quickly because there's no mechanical to speak of in that space. Um, the roofing work is scheduled to start the week of May 11th, and uh, we'll coordinate that with uh, the mechanical work in the penthouse. And after that work is done with the roof, that will free us up to start the exterior improvements, cleaning and tuck pointing the exterior of the building. Any questions on the work at City Hall? Yeah, Kevin, I have one. With the AV upgrades in the council chambers, are we going to have the same functionality we had at the uh, county courthouse? I don't know who can answer that question, but it's just a question I have. Is Sean on the line? Sean's here, yeah. Uh, I'll take a stab at it. Um, more or less, yes. We have a slightly different appliance that we're going to be trying, um, but we'll still be streaming to YouTube. And it is yet to be determined if we'll be uh, broadcasting to cable or not. Uh, we hope to. Have we figured out if there's a cable connection possible? Uh, there's still cable coming in the boiler room downstairs, so it's still a possibility. Um, what's happened is changes at the high school, the head end unit has changed, so there is some pretty significant uphill climb there, but uh, hopefully once this whole thing passes, we can figure out what's possible. Okay, thank you. That answers my question. Does anybody else have questions of Kevin or anybody on the remodel projects? Kevin? I got one quick question. Are we on schedule, behind, ahead? Where are we at? Uh, I would say we're on schedule. Um, I think we met pretty much the dates that we established going in. You know, the, the city staff working from home has made that less critical. Uh, but it's also allowed work to proceed uh, more quickly. So I would say if you look at where we are compared to where we're going to be, we're, we're about on track. Good, thank you. Um, one other thing I will say is we've had a few small change order items. We haven't written any change orders since the last upgrade. So um, budget-wise, we're, we're on track with, with uh, I would say, Fairly insignificant cost adjustments to uh, for change orders. That's good. Any other questions? Okay, uh, move on to the police station. Um, there again, we were we benefited from uh, the silver lining and all of the the disruptions that the virus has brought is that uh, we were able to work in the police department uh, more easily without having to allow for access by the public. Uh, so we were able to work on the new entry and the secure window at the reception desk without spending the money to create a temporary access for the public. Um, we completed the, the First uh, part of the project was to create a new space for the server. Uh, the server was relocated this past weekend, so we cleared that hurdle. I think Sean has probably reported that that went well. Um, that freed up the invest or uh, the uh, interview space for remodel, which has started. Uh, should have started today, actually. Uh, work in the investigators' offices is ongoing. I think we're taping drywall there. And um, when we finish those spaces, we will go into the squad room and work on the windows and uh, the interior finishes in the squad room. So what, what that has done for us is basically we're there and able to do work as the police department staff is able to 
give us space to work. So we're able to work at the pace that they can give us and still uh, have their ongoing operations work. So it's, it's been good for both parties uh, actually to be able to continue work without demobilizing and coming back later and, and uh, having different separate phases. It's basically just rolled into one continuous phase. Excellent. Any questions on the police department project? Okay. Anything else, Kevin? I can't, I can't think of anything. I really, uh, my hat's off to the staff of, of both City Hall and the police station. They've been very, very great to work with, uh, open to options and, and uh, you know, considering uh, whatever it takes to get the work done and, and uh, being being very good partner in uh, in the projects. Good, that's good to hear. No more comments or questions from the council or mayor? Seeing none, thank you for stopping in tonight, Kevin. Yeah, you're welcome, thank you. Just an 8D COVID-19 update and discussion to Jennifer. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the council. Um, so as you know, the, the governor's initial executive order 2020, which was directing Minnesotans to stay at home, um, the, the city council adopted a couple of things, um, one of which was our stay at home work plan. Um, then on April 6th, it was amended uh, to coincide with the governor's timeline, basically. And so I sent you out a memo uh, this afternoon. And first of all, my apologies for it being late. Uh, the governor did come out with his latest order 2048 on Thursday afternoon. And then we met as a team, um, including Alderman Pritchett, both on Friday and this morning to try to come back to the council with some recommendations. Um, in the beginning part of that memo, I did kind of list out the things that the, the actions that the council has taken to date. And so I'm just going to shift us into um, the most recent orders, that's 2040 and 2048. Uh, as a result of those, um, the governor has been kind of clear, I think, in his orders, while he's allowing non-critical sectors to return to safe workplaces, he's also stressing many times in those orders that those who can work from home should continue to work from home. However, we are entering into our busier season and that's construction. So we know um, we have several street projects coming up. Our permits are starting to increase. And so it has been more challenging, I think, for engineering and our community development department, as well as our parks department to continue to work from home. So we do have some recommendations in here to kind of start to um, adjust to bringing some people uh, back to work. I would refer you down to the bottom of the memo where we do have our COVID-19 work from home plan. And that was what you originally saw at that emergency meeting in March, um, where we identified those employees who must remain on the job for the governor's order, those who could work from home, and then those who were unable to work from home. So I'll just kind of go backwards a little bit. Those who were unable to work from home, as you recall, the first two weeks after, after the governor did his stay at home order, those employees did go home for that two week period. We called them back after it was extended. And so parks and uh, streets are working um, and have been working. They are working staggered shifts and we're making sure that we're implementing some social distancing. Our uh, police management records management techs that's another category. It's been a little challenging because of the dual authentic authentication that is required through the police department. It's hard to send those staff to work from home and still maintain the security that's needed through the police department. So then going up to that telework or those who were able to work from home, we've modified that category and calling it now modified teleworking employees. If you look at that again with the governor's recommendation that those who can work from home should work from home. Um, I, I will continue to work from home. Our community development department will start to work at City Hall on a limited basis. 
Um, our finance uh, will continue to work from home. However, Connie and and uh, Pam will work re, uh, start kind of limited work from City Hall. And then um, as we look down to engineering, our engineering staff will all start working from home um, if the council should approve this work from home plan tonight. Our recommendation would be that they return to City Hall tomorrow. They're doing things like surveying and they're more out in the field. And so it's much more, it's much easier to have them right at City Hall. Um, I did add a category into this as well, and that's our interns. Um, as you know, we are starting to hire our interns. So that's at the very bottom of that spreadsheet. Um, we are showing that the communications marketing person, our intern would work from home at least initially. Um, and our code compliance uh, would really need to work in the office. David is thinking of the code person will start a week from today, and then David will begin to work in the office. Our GIS intern and our HR intern have the ability to work from home, while both parks and streets interns would not. So um, back up to the memo, um, so really, trying to figure out how we balance. Um, as you know, the governor extended the stay at home order to May 18th, knowing that those who could work should work from home, do work from home. However, allowing some of those office staff, non-facing customers to be able to return from work. So I think we put together a plan that we think will really work for city hall. Um, and so with that, Mr. President, if I may, um, there's also a section in here on the police department and I'd like Corky to, speak to that and what what the police department will be doing sounds good corky thank you so if you look at what's been outlined in the memo probably the most simplest way i can use to describe it too is we've taken the police department and really made two departments within the one so while half of the department is working the other half is on their days off or in situations like the investigators and myself and the deputy chief well one team is at work working, the other is working remotely from home. So with the officers and kind of what all the patrol staff, what I alluded to with the two teams is we switched from our normal rotation, which was a four week thing of four on, three off, four on, three off, seven on, three off, one on, three off. So we went to an eight on, six off rotation, but technically on that eighth day, the team that's been working all those days is on what I'm calling precautionary administrative leave because that's our overlap day. That's the day where the two teams would normally work. And what we'd normally do is use two of those days a month to train. Well, we're not doing any face-to-face, -face, hands-on training at this time. Um, we're working on how we're going to accomplish some of our uh, post mandates as far as defensive tactics. We got a bunch of that in in um, January and February. So we do have firearms shoot, which we'll hope to use the outdoor range and practice social distancing. But where we would normally do a lot of our scenario-based, role-based, hands-on, face-to-face training, we're just not doing it now. We're gonna try and do it. Hopefully there's an opportunity this fall or late summer. Um, so back to that schedule then, on their eighth day, that's the administrative precautionary leave so they're not that day. Um, the other team then takes over. The biggest other reason for that is to try and um, conserve and make the best use of our personal protection equipment, particularly the masks. So what we've done is issued these surgical grade masks. Um, each officer currently has seven of those, and they're for each day they work. So they they get placed into a paper bag unless the mask gets destroyed or suspected contamination. And so then they'll reuse that mask 14 days later with the assumption that if there was stuff on it that we weren't aware of, that hopefully the virus is um, beyond its uh, time that it, it's exposed or that somebody could contract it. So that was part of the philosophy behind that or why some agencies have chosen to go to that was to conserve the PPEs. Um, we have a record staff. What I would say is they're probably working at about 60% of the capacity. And that's what Jennifer alluded to is mostly because of devices. We don't have enough of our devices that we can run through the encryption that's required to access the system. So 
we've devised a schedule where with the exception of uh, Julie, our police administrative supervisor, she continues to work full time. She'll intermittently come into the office when needs be to access certain systems that she can't remotely or to handle paper that we don't have a choice. Same with a couple of the other gals. They're coming in intermittently one day a week. But the um, computers that we can. So we have, I think, four computers. One stays with Julie all the time. The other three were rotating through the other five staff. So um, I think you know, our goal is, I got to be honest with you, it's been really helpful not to have them there during the construction project. Um, if there was, like Kevin had alluded to, I said this before, if there was a silver lining in the virus thing, it was that it allowed us to do that um, front counter work, the glass replacement, the wall treatment, and the vestibule construction, and not have our staff there. So I don't, that saved us a lot of money, and it also saved us um, some major headaches and inconvenience because there has been some challenges just based upon noise, sheet dust, and navigating back and forth in our building, but we were doing I think, pretty good. And hats off to Sean and Lori for um, turning our meeting room into temporary workstations for the staff. So I'll, I'll answer any questions if there is any. I have a question, Corky. Just how has it been going over at the police department? I mean, have, has it have you been operating pretty effectively? Things considered with people, the administrative staff working remotely and things like that. You know, I it's been surprisingly good. Um, I think it's a combination of things. Um, one, we changed some business practices. The officers have to type all their reports now. We're not transcribing statements. We're gonna cross that road when this ends and see what the prosecutors request. So they're piling up. Um, and I think what we'll do is just the bare bones as needed when they request them. But for the most part, processing our police reports and the state reporting and that stuff, it's been going surprisingly well. Um, when I did an interview for Lakeland TV a week or so ago, um, I did run some numbers. March 15th to April 15th, when you compare 2019 to 2020, we were down 400 ICRs. So where we normally have 1,400 ICRs in a one-month period, we only had 1,000. Um, I'll be honest with you, a lot of that's probably traffic enforcement. Um, we've really asked the guys to pick and choose serious violations and not unnecessarily expose themselves. And I'd like to think a big part of it is to track traffic volumes are down on the roads. When I do my monthly report this month, I'll be curious. I'll run for you how many car crashes we've had because the car crashes are – have really drastically reduced too. So I think the lack of the volume of traffic on our roadways has significantly impacted how busy our officers are with crashes and with traffic violations. Um, I can tell you from firsthand experience, we are still writing tickets. I came in the other morning and had a truck going 66 on Washington at North A Street. So I wrote a ticket. I mean, we're still, the violations are still there. And it seems like the ones that we're seeing are more significant than what we normally do, but really surprisingly so far, things have been going good. Um, you know, some challenges that we've had to deal with is uh, the jail and the reduction of who they'll accept. Um, you look at like today's arraignment list, after a weekend like this, this time of year, there'd probably be anywhere from 12 to 20 people. There's four people for the whole county, three of them are RRS and they're domestic disputes. So that was going to be another. Yeah, hang on a second. So that was going to be another question I had: Is uh, how are the complaints? Are you getting a lot more complaints? Is there less crime, more crime? Throw, forget the traffic stuff, but like individuals calling, having been victimized somehow. At first, it was significantly down. It took a nosedive. I come in, in the morning and I couldn't believe the lack of calls we had, but it is slowly creeping back up. Um, we had some car prowling thefts, some other stuff. I think with the weather getting nicer, and now people um, probably say this, or the activity level, I think, is going to start to get closer to normal. Because the last, I'd say, week, we've been busier. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jane, you had some questions? Yes, I do. Um, 
I'm concerned about the mask we're using. Um, you know, that's usually not highly recommended. Is there anything that the city could do uh, to see a way of um, assisting so we wouldn't be use, reusing those masks? Um, that, that's a good question. Right now, the thing is, we're not going to reuse the mask if we have a known exposure. Um, and keep in mind, these aren't the N95 masks. What we're really doing is holding back on using those until we have more reported cases and it, it, it's more of an issue in our community. So right now, the masks we're wearing are more just a precautionary um, and it's to promote to get the officers acclimated to wearing it. But I, I don't have concerns with how we're reusing these ones now, but when it gets to the point where we, re, where we have to use N95s, we probably won't be able to. There's some different theories up there about cleaning them with ultraviolet lights and some other uh, treatments, but when we get to the N95 level, we probably won't be reusing those ones at all. Okay. Well, Mr. Chair, again, a question. Um, would the city or and the police department or even the city, if we do, would they be, um, would allow these, made, these fabric masks that are being made and the reason I say that, um, they would be able to be washed, um, you know, after a, a working day, which would be important. And then, you know, just two or three of them and just rewash them would be uh, probably a little bit more comfortable. And you could even put filters in some of these. So I'm, I guess I would um, ask the police department and the city if that is something they would be amenable to. Because if they would, I would, I would really like to uh, start trying to get that for everybody. We have accepted a large amount of cloth made masks from the public. Um, I got to be honest with you, the surgical ones that we've got are lightweight and they're quicker on and off. And the staff does seem to like those better than the cloth ones. Okay. We started with cloth ones and we do. We washed them ourselves. We had several donations. We do have a pretty good stockpile of cloth ones now to fall back on. But um, these the surgical ones, I should have brought one. I normally have one with me so I could show you. Um, they're more comfortable. They're easier to take on and off um, okay. than the cloth ones that we tried. Okay. Understand. Thank you. Thanks, Jan. Any other questions? <laughs> Seeing none. Okay, thanks, Corky. So thank you, Mr. President. It's kind of a nice segue into our discussion. Um, so should the council approve this plan tonight, um, one of the things that we would be doing is sending a letter to all of our staff about the requirements for social distancing and keeping their areas clean. Um, I know Chief Holmes, there's a fire, so I don't know if we lost him. Um, if he ran out to a fire, but Chief Holmes is working on a preparedness plan that we will be bringing to the council at a future meeting. Um, but just know that one of the things we are looking at is making sure that we have enough um, sanitizer and bleach and making things good. Tim, you are back, take it away. Yeah. I'm itching and screaming in my seat here. Um, yes, we, uh, We'll continue to work on that plan. We're uh, making sure that we have the necessary supplies. So when we do um, go back to work, that we're uh, protecting our employees and doing what's recommended as far as uh, the necessary cleaning of workspaces, uh, meeting rooms, those types of things. So um, we're we're doing pretty good on supplies as far as um, hand sanitizer. Uh, we picked up that bleach that um, Alderman Bevins recommended a few, probably three or four weeks ago now. Um, so we have that. Uh, I picked up um, numerous spray bottles here today. So again, we're just continuing to work on, on those things and also just preparing um, the documentation as to who's going to do what and what needs to be done um, each day or throughout the day. So, Mr. President, before we transition into parking, I'm not sure if there are any other questions about the proposed stay at home work plan um, as we transition at least into having some staff come back to work. Um, and I think any of us 
would be happy to answer any questions on that part, Mr. President. Mr. Chair. Jan. When, this is Jan. Um, when is the plan return to work day? It is going to be the 18th as, or, or what? Um, Mr. President, uh, Alderman Lambert, I, so I think right now the people that are identified in that spreadsheet at the bottom of the memo that was sent mm -hmm. this afternoon, those employees would be returning to work on Wednesday. If you recall today, okay. um, the uh, cleaning crew was in, service master was in to clean all of City Hall. Tomorrow, uh, all of our offices are being put back together and engineering is moving into their permanent location on the third floor. So I think um, City Engineer Sandy's intent was to have his guys come back on Wednesday. Paul, is that correct? Okay. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Jan. We, so I suppose you want a motion to adopt or accept this updated work from home plan. Dave, yes, I'd like to move to approve staff's plan to implement governor's orders. Uh, what is that? 2040, 2048 in regards to COVID-19. Second, Stunick. We have a motion by Pritchett, a second by Stunick to uh, adopt the uh, updated work from home plan. Is there any discussion? None. We'll vote by roll call. T. Erickson? Yes. Lambert? Yes. Stunick? Yes. Pritchett? Yes. W. Erickson? Bevins? Yes. And Johnson? Johnson, yes. That motion carries. So thank you, Mr. Chair. I think the next part of the memo is to talk about parking. Um, as you know, the executive order that the governor released on Thursday, 2048, does allow businesses, including retail stores and other businesses that sell, maintain, or repair goods that can be picked up outside without entering the place of business can open. So really, what does that mean? That's curbside pickup. Um, the city council agreed at their April 6th meeting to not enforce parking restrictions because businesses weren't open at that time. Um, and now the businesses are beginning to reopen. As a result, we've heard from a number of our businesses asking the council to resume um, enforcing parking restrictions. Um, we have also heard about the possibility of maybe designating a curbside pickup um, spot in front of a business. Our committee, which again included Alderman Pritchett, talked about that this morning quite a bit. And our thought was, or our recommendation to council tonight is to start with not enforcing parking and see how that goes between now and May 18th. And then we may want to bring something back to the council um, at the May 18th meeting if the curb side delivery is not working well, even with enforcing parking restrictions. So um, Mr. President, I'll, I'll stop and answer any questions. Can you clarify that recommendation? Are we we are enforcing parking until the 18th or we are not enforcing two hour parking? Thank you, Mr. President. That's another thing that we discussed this morning. Our recommendation would be a, um, that we would start enforcing parking on May 11th. The reason there is a delay between now and May 11th is that it would give us the opportunity to notify everybody and really get the word out for those who have been parking downtown. It would just give us a little bit of time to make sure that we're sharing with residents that we are once again going to be enforcing parking restrictions. Okay, so we'd it'd be a week from today uh, upon your the committee's recommendation a week from today. Did you, and you discussed a curbside, but did you discuss the possibility of allowing business owners just to put their own sandwich board up in front saying, this is my curbside spot, please respect it, but with no enforcement mechanisms and no city enforcement of removing signs in the right of way. Bridget, Jennifer, anybody? You know, we didn't really talk too much about the uh, possibility of having stores do them themselves. We did look at um, putting up signage and the amount of time it would take to make official signage uh, and, and the cost is uh, pretty prohibitive. Um, what our thought was, it was to reestablish the parking restrictions and then see if there's still a need to allow 
shop owners to ask for, you know, the ability to put up a sandwich sign or something else along those lines. Jansky. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, we did hear from a couple of business owners, uh, specifically heard from Teresa Woodward, who owns Cattails. She actually went around to pretty much all the downtown businesses and asked them this question. Um, there was only one owner that really kind of requested that short-term um, parking, and that's only because of a, a physical ability. Although Otherwise, no one else was requesting that 15-minute kind of designated curbside pickup spot. Additionally, Chief McQuiston shared that fit, when it comes to enforcement, it's very difficult to do 15 minutes. Um, as someone had to call and say someone's been parked in 15 minutes, X amount of time, they'd have to go down there and then wait 15 minutes to see if the vehicle had not moved. Um, so there was an enforcement issue with that. We felt that if we offered them to have that 15 minute, there might be that expectation of enforcement. And that's where we kind of decide let's Let's start by enforcing and then see where we where we come on the 18th. Okay, Alderman Evans. Mr. Chair, I believe there is a 15 minute parking space in front of Coco Moon on the north side of Laurel at the corner of six and Laurel, and that's a city sign. That's not a, a homemade sign. And whether we enforce it or not, I don't know, but we do have precedents for a 15 minute parking downtown, I think. And I believe Mr. President, Chief McQuiston can speak to the calls they get about that spot. I believe there's a 15 or 20 in front of the uh, art gallery too. But yeah, I, my question wasn't really so much revolving around putting up city owned signs for a temporary period of time, but just something way more low key where we allow business owners to put out a little sign saying, hey, this is my curbside to go, and just hoping people honor it. And then the city not enforcing that they have signs in the public right of way, which we do not allow. You know, and I think, Chair, yeah, Jan. Mr. Chair, I do like your idea. I think it would be a good, um, a test, good test project. Uh, for them to do that, we would have to, you know, we could designate you could only have one sign or two signs max. Um, but I think that would be a, a, a good testing. And I really don't feel comfortable enforcing the uh, parking uh, right now, for, uh, the parking right now. I think it'd be too early. Okay, does uh, any other thoughts, Tad? Yeah, this is Tad. Um, President Johnson, I do like that idea of allowing the businesses to kind of put up their own sign, you know, knowing that there's no no city of enforcement going going along with that. Um, but I, and I guess I do like the uh, you know resuming the the um, the enforcement. I think um, can we add the cat the context of saying you know this is because of the um, the curbside. You know, because of the governor's executive order, the changes to it, um, and just make it known that that's why we're we're resuming that. I think just providing that context would be helpful, so it's not just an arbitrary decision from the city to to start doing that. Possible. Okay, I like that too, Jennifer. Yeah, Mr. President, Alderman Erickson, I think that was really the discussion on the committee too, on delaying the reinforcement or starting to enforce parking again until May 11th, just so that we were able to get word out. I would assume that a lot of our tenants who are living down there are now parking on 7th and 8th and Laurel. So really just to give them an opportunity to say, hey, by the way, the city is going to start enforcing again a week from today. So that was the reason for our recommendation being May 11th. Okay, I'm ready for a motion, I suppose, unless anybody else has questions. Alderman Mr. Chair. I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, I would like to, to move that the city uh, begin enforcement of the, the parking starting May 11th and allow shop owners to put a non-enforceable uh, sign dedicating one curbside pickup space, if they so please. Lambert, second. 
We have a motion by Pritchett and a second by Lambert. Any discussion? Hearing none, we'll vote by roll call. T. Erickson? Yes. Lambert? Yes. Stunick? Yes. Pritchett? Yes. W. Erickson? W. Erickson? Yes. Evans? Yes. And Johnson? Yes, that motion carries. Is there any other action you need on COVID related stuff tonight, Jennifer? No, but again, thank you for your patience with this. As you know, the information is coming out. We're having a very short period of time by which we have to respond. So we really appreciate your flexibility in allowing this to be uh, sent out to all of the council later. So thank you all. Yeah, excellent. And great work to city staff and Jennifer. And thanks again, Alderman Pritchett for meeting with them. To Keep things rolling along as things are changing so fast in these times. That uh, moves us on to item number nine, new business. 9A is the first reading of proposed ordinance 1507, an ordinance amending Brainerd City Code section 421, uniform fire code. Tim? Yes, thank you. Um, this is just a update to our current fire code. Um, in March 31st, uh, 2020, the state adopted the 2020 state fire code. So this ordinance would just amend our city code to reflect um, the adoption of the 2020 uh, state fire code. Along with that, we've added um, a couple appendices that some we've had in there and just been renamed and a couple um, additions. I can give you just a brief description on those. Uh, Appendix K uh, refers to ambulatory care. Um, again, just giving us the ability um, with some options to assess uh, minimal fire and safety uh, requirements for buildings with ambulatory care in them. Um, N refers to uh, indoor trades and exhibits. Again, some of these are already in uh, the state fire code, but these um, deal with more complex uh, trade show issues um, that we just have the potential to see with the new development at the NP space and um, their ability to offer a larger space. Uh, these deal with more complex um, trade show exhibits like two story covered um, covered um, booths and stuff like that. Uh, Appendix O has just been renamed from, it was previously K, uh, which we had adopted um, previously in 2016. Um, and that just deals with um, barbecues on balconies and patios. And then P is refers to emergency response radio coverage. And that's something that Chief McQuist and I have been working on with the school district currently. Um, and this just gives us um, those guidelines to follow. Uh, the school district has been extremely receptive into um, making sure that our emergency radios are working within all of their schools. Um, and this, uh, you, you know, they'll do a study and they'll follow these recommendations, but um, they've been doing it voluntarily. Um, at this point, but this just gives us the guidance and the recommendations to um, require those uh, type of additions in these larger buildings where radio coverage sometimes becomes an issue um, deeper down into the building or with the concrete steel construction and stuff like that. So um, that's just a quick brief description of those. Um, the other um, striked out areas are just to clean up the ordinance. Um, those are not needed any longer. Um, those sections have been changed within the state code. So unless you have any other questions, that's all I have. Any questions? Doesn't look like it. Thanks, Tim. I guess we're looking for a motion to dispense with the first reading. So move, Bevan. Sure. Second, Lambert. Motion by Bevin, second by Lambert. Any discussion? T. Erickson? Yes. Lambert? 
Yes. Stunick? Yes. W. Erickson? Yes. Bevins? Yes. And Johnson? Yes, that motion carries. That brings us to 9B, resolution receiving feasibility report and calling a public hearing on improvement number 1405, Old Stonebridge Trail final lift, Paul. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, uh, as you all are well aware, um, we uh, earlier in the year we approved uh, or or in concept to getting the uh, old Stonebridge Trail final lift put on. Uh, this is a road up off of Riverside Drive that back when it was constructed in 2004, 2005, uh, the first lift of asphalt was put down um, and it was left that way. Uh, so there's about a, a two inch um, uh, lip at the curb line and um, the structures and things need to be raised up and the final lift needs to be installed. So the council uh, approved putting that into our five year capital improvement plan and assessing 100% of the costs to the adjacent property owners as would have been done back when it was originally constructed. Uh, this resolution uh, here tonight really um, assesses the fee and sets the public hearing uh, for June 1st, 2020, which would be the improvement hearing uh, to hear testimony uh, for or against the proposed improvement, which consists of about an $80,000 overlay on Old Stonebridge Trail and some sanitary sewer adjustments that we don't typically assess for. Um, obviously, the improvement is feasible and cost effective as uh, this, it was never done in the first place. Um, and it should be done to protect the assets and infrastructure that we have uh, in uh, the, the the road itself. So, um, if it, there's any questions, I can answer them now. Paul, I have one. How much would this have cost in 2004 or whenever it was originally done? I would anticipate probably about you know 25 percent less. Yeah, should have gotten her done then. But it's 100 percent accessible. Any other questions? I'll take a motion, Bevins. I have a motion, Mr. Chair, when you're ready. Send it. I move that we adopt the attached resolution, receiving the feasibility report, and setting the public hearing on the improvement to take place on June 1st, 2020 at 7.30 during the regularly scheduled council meeting. Second, Pritchett. Motion, Bevins. Second, Pritchett. Is there any discussion? <laughs> Seeing none, we'll vote by roll call. T. Erickson? Yes. Lambert? Yes. Stunick? Yes. Pritchett? Yes. W. Erickson? Yes. Bevins? Yes. And Johnson? Yes, that motion carries. We'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is appoint a council member to the Region 5 Children's Museum Task Force. Does anybody want to be the council member on the Region 5 Children's Museum Task Force? Mr. Chair, this is Lambert. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. What do we what happened to the committee we um developed well a few months ago now when we still could see people? Yeah, Jennifer. I think I've um Mr. President, um Alderman Lambert, so the letter of intent was approved and the uh, master plan for WSN or now Whitseth to do the master plan. There were two things. Uh, we created a working group, which had its first meeting last week. And now the next thing is to create the master plan. And so I think that's what you're referring to. I think the park board already did appoint somebody. I think it'll be on the EDA agenda and also on the planning commission agenda. So now we're looking for a council member and uh, community members. Okay. Does that answer your question, Jan? I I I think so because I know I was one of the I was going to kind of hold two two roles there. One was uh, council and once was planning. Did and planning appoint you? Good, but we haven't done anything on that yet. Okay. I don't, you know, and I think the other one, Dave Bedeau, was going to do uh, was going to do it too. But I know he's in a different role now. But. Um, yeah, I wouldn't mind being on the master plan. If that's okay with the commission, the uh, council. 
You would like to be the, the council liaison to the Region 5 Children's Museum? Yes, I would, if that's okay with the council. Uh, I'll, yeah, Thank you. I'll approve. What was that? Move to approve. Second. I have a motion by Bevin to second by Pritchett to approve Jan to be the, re the council liaison to the Region 5 Children's Museum Task Force. Any discussion? Seeing the mayor with his hand up, I will take a question. My question is, under the item there, it says uh, a task force is to be established with representatives. It says two council members on this. Are we just appointing a liaison or uh, is, am I reading this incorrectly? I didn't read it. You tell me, read it to me, Dave. Well, as it says in, uh, excuse me here, item number three of the letter that is in our packet here, uh, it says a task force is to be established with the with uh, will be responsible for the site master plan processing. The task force will include nine to 11 members, including the following two council members, one EDA, one planning commission, one park board, three R5CM members. So I'm just okay. So we're going to, we'll, we'll need a second uh, t task force member out of, out of our group here, but let's vote on this motion to appoint Jan. And we'll vote any other discussion on it. None. Vote by roll. T. Erickson? Yes. Lambert? Yes. Stunick? Yes. Pritchett? Yes. W. Erickson? Yes. Bevins? Yes. And Johnson? Yes. That motion carries, so we need to appoint a second. I know it says council member, but I I do know when, when Mayor Bideau was on the council, he wanted to be a, a Leah. Yeah. Lea, Lea. If the if the council is amenable to it, we'll we can appoint the mayor. Alderman Pritchett. I move to appoint Mayor Bedeau to this committee. Second. We have a motion and a second to appoint Mayor Bedeau. Is there any discussion? Mr. Chair. Kelly. I like I like Mayor Bedeau um, to do to do everything. But um, <laughs> there's also an EVA member and you know, we have some council members that could fulfill both. Now, I, I don't see the reason why we can't appoint two different people to those spots. But I just bring that up because Alderman Lampert satisfies the council member and the planning commission. And that, you know, I don't know if there's a benefit to that. Maybe not. I bring it up. Thank you. That's a good point because we almost have an EDA quorum here right now. Actually, we may have a quorum. <laughs> because it may be and, you or Kit or Wayne or myself being the EDA liaison to, to that commission. Mr. Chair, this is Lambert. And that's, I guess that's what I was remembering more was this number three, um, where we did do a double duty on a, on a lot of this stuff. So, um, but I, I, having said that, I suspect with the fact that we have three, um, three members from the R5CM that perhaps we will want a little bit more representative from, from the city on the board. Uh, yeah. And I agree with the latter half of your point there, Jan. I think the more representing the city on that commission is gonna increase the likelihood that the outcome is good for the city. Kelly. Correct. I agree, let's let's vote on Dave Bedeau. Okay, any other discussion? Yeah. Any discussion on Dave? Seeing none, we'll vote. T. Erickson? Yes. Lambert? Yes. Stunick? Yes. Yes. W. Erickson? Yes. Bevins? Yes. Johnson? Yes, that motion carries. Is that all we need to do for Region 5 right now? Yes, and Mr. Mr. President, if... Jennifer? Yep, and then the other thing would be to open it up to three community members and that we would take applications. Okay, Kelly, you had something? I, I just thought the EDA meets Thursday and could nominate an EVA member then to satisfy that. And being that the Planning Commission has not nominated Jan Lampert, it's possible that we could fill all our spots and not double up any. And I just wanted yeah. to point that out. It may be a recommendation to the Planning Commission not to pick Jan Lampert only to put more representation from the city on that committee. I thought that was a good idea. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kelly. So I think a motion to open up for applications through our traditional committee application process for three member, three citizens of Brainerd to apply to serve as at-large members of this commission. And Mr. Chair, we would, and we would ask that though uh, we take applications until the 13th, so that can be on your agenda on May 18th for your consideration for appointment. Okay, a motion Chair, to accept. I'll, Jan. I'll make that motion if nobody's done that. Second. Has a second. Motion by Lambert, second by Pritchett to open up applications for three at large citizens of Brainerd to serve on this commission. Application period will be open through May 13th. Any discussion? End of uh, business day, May 13th, 4 30. Hearing no discussion, we will vote on roll call. T. Erickson? Yes. Lambert? Yes. Studic? Yes. Pritchett? Yes. W. Erickson? Yes. Bevins? Yes. Johnson? Yes, motion carries. Brings us to number 9D, review council appointments. Jennifer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. With the appointment or with the resolution of Mayor Mink and the appointment of Alderman Bedeau as mayor, and now with the appointment of Wade Erickson as our uh, alderman for Wayne uh, Ward 3, we now have a full council. So there are a couple of attachments to uh, your to the council report. One it just shows our council assignments, who's on PNF, who's on safety and public works, who the chairs are for each of those. And then next is each council member, uh, what ward they serve their term and their title, and then uh, what Committee, they are a liaison to. And then the next is a list of all of our boards, commissions, or committees in alphabetical order, um, who the appointment is made by, and who the, li the liaison is to that board, committee, or commission. And as you can see, we have several gaps. Um, these appointments are either made by Council President Johnson or by Mayor Badeau. And with that, Mr. President, I will turn it back to you. Thank you, uh, Alderman Bevins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Does not Dave Bedell, the mayor's position, come up for a special election for a two-year term in 2020? That is correct. He is with our state cycle. on our chart. Alderman Bevins, thank you. That will be corrected, and thank you for pointing that out. My apologies. So with that, Mayor Bedell, Jan. I, I think we need to check, uh, change Tad Erickson too, because I believe that is uh, also a, a special election this year. That may be. Let's uh, let's let's double check all of those documents and make sure we have everything right there. But I did. All... Oh, Connie. Sorry, uh, we did just send the list of elections of who and the mayor and. Um, um, and Tad seat the at large. Those are the two that are special elections for this year that will fulfill two more year terms. Thank you. So with that, we have a bunch of open spots. I'll toss it over to the mayor to make some appointments. Yeah, so I'll just go right down the list as listed for what the mayor needs to select. I have spoke with a handful of you um, just to make sure that you have interest and or availability on these um uh, there was one that i missed so hopefully we won't uh, we won't have too many problems with it but let's go right down the list it we are looking at uh the brainer public utilities puc uh for that i would like to select councilman Pres or council president johnson to represent that do you, gabe do you want to just go down the list or do you want me to just do all mine and then you go back into yours you just do all of yours at once, and as long as nobody has an object, if somebody has an objection, we'll pull that one out to debate it. Otherwise, we'll approve them all at one fell swoop. Sounds good. All right, uh, cable TV advisory committee. Uh, for that, we'll be looking at uh, Wayne Erickson. The let's skip down here. Make sure I'm not missing something. 
Uh, Park Board, I have selected myself to continue representing that group for the remainder of this year. Uh, and then lastly, the Rental Housing Board of Appeals. Uh, Wayne, I did not speak with you about that one, but that is a group that only meets in a very uh, specific uh, reason. And I would select Wayne Erickson for that role as well. Okay, is there a motion to approve or deny, or does you want to pull out any of the appointments? Move to approve, Bevins. Second, Bridget. Second. Okay. We have, we have a motion by Bevins and Pritchett to approve the slate of nominations and recommendations. Any discussion? Hearing none, we'll vote by roll call. T. Erickson? Yes. Lambert? Yes. Stunick? Yes. Pritchett? Yes. W. Erickson? Yes. Bevins? Yes. And Johnson? Johnson, yes, that motion carries. And I have a few appointments here, and I maybe just two. I have two appointments, and I two called around and talked to people, but I didn't. I had the mayor do it for me, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to appoint. I'm going to recommend for the Walkable Bicycle Committee, Alderman Wayne Erickson, and for the Riverfront Committee, Alderman Tad Erickson. Move to approve. Lambert second. We have a motion and a second to approve. Any discussion? Mayor Bedeau. There is the, the inclusion of the Water Tower Committee as well. And then on our list here, it lists you as uh, being Bladeck, but you are not listed as being the liaison in the chart above. Okay, yeah, let's talk about that. Let's pass, let's vote on this motion. Any discussion about the two appointments none we'll vote t erickson yes Amber? yes yes stunick bridget yes bridget erickson evans yes and johnson yes and that motion carries so back to bladeck we have some type of spot on the bladeck board Jennifer, can you explain that? Or Tyler, is he still here? No, Jennifer. So as I understand, um, we do not, uh, we, we have a liaison position. We are invited to attend. It is not a voting member of that board. As I understand, the city administrator and the mayor have attended that in the past. I have only been to one Blade Act board meeting since I have taken my position. So it is, a liaison non-voting. And appointed by, or not appointed, it just is the mayor. It just has been the mayor. I don't know that it's ever been any official. I think it's just been an invitation to attend. I see maybe David has a comment. Maybe he knows more than I do. Uh, Mr. President, I, to my knowledge in the past, with, I don't know, the city minister was attending. When Cassandra left, I kind of took that on and I had been attending for the last five months before Jennifer came on um, at, on behalf of the city. Uh, I think Mayor Mink, he did attend a number, a number of times when he could, but he was not always um, present at those meetings. And those are very special meetings. The board sometimes has like the board meeting with their government liaisons and then sometimes they have board only meetings so fortunately tyler left he would have been able to explain exactly what they do better it's Mr. at most Mr. once a month yeah um i'd be happy to volunteer to attend those meetings if um well i'll be happy to volunteer yeah well is that a, is that i think that's a mayoral appointment jennifer okay make the appointment like the recommendation <laughs> Love to recommend that uh, Ted Erickson uh, be our liaison for that group. Second. Or move to approve. Second. A motion by Bevin, second by Pritchett for the mayor recommendation of Ted Erickson to serve as our council liaison to the Bladeck board. Any discussion? T. Erickson? Yes. Lambert? Yes. Stunick? Pritchett? Yes. 
W. Erickson? Yes. Evans? Yes. Ann Johnson? Yes, motion carries. Did we uh, get everything appointed? It's vacant. The, only the only other question I had was about the water tower committee. You're, you're the man. You're the tower. You're our beacon of hope there, Dave. I'll give you another five bucks for a keychain. <laughs> They're twenty dollars. <laughs> but that in the past hasn't really been when we formed it, like we just kind of received five, six, seven applications and they were all on it. I don't think it was really a recommendation vote to approve thing. You guys selected me as your representation for that group. For life. <laughs> Well, let's let's reaffirm that, Alderman Bevins. I move to keep Dave Badeau chained to the water tower for life. <laughs> Lambert second. <laughs> a motion and a second to keep Badeau chained to the water tower for life. In a suit and tie. <laughs> Mayor Badeau. In, in this uh, discussionary phase, I would like to pass it out to any of you uh, council members would also like to get involved. You can join as a member of uh, the or the city as well. Not, I mean, excuse me, a, a member, a citizen is what I'm trying to say. That's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> it is a citizens committee, and I would toss it out to any of you who would like to join as a citizen. Duly noted. Any other discussion? We'll all Mr. Be Chair, could, Mr. Mr. Chair, could Dave yeah. tell us all the time? Could Dave tell us the time and date and time? Yes, that I is the third, third Wednesday of the month at 6 p.m. Okay. All right, yeah, so Jan, if you're interested, bring it back to us next time. We'll uh, get you on there. Oh, no, well, I would love to, but I'm on the planning and zoning, and that's when we need to. So, well, it's I, a piece. Thank you. Anyway, we have everything appointed now. We can move on to 10 planning commission. Can we vote on that? Sorry, thank you, Alderman Pritchett. No more discussion. We'll vote on uh, the mayor being chained to the water tower for life in a suit and tie. Erickson. Yes. Lambert. Yes. Stunick. Yeah. Pritchett. Most indubitably. <laughs> yes. W. Erickson. Yes, but he doesn't need to wear a shirt and tie. <laughs> you should go topless or what? <laughs> Bevins. <laughs> and Johnson. Yes, that motion carries. Moving on to Yes, Jennifer. Mr. Chair, I'm sorry to to oh, he's got a jacket. Ever. Um, we do have three council members on the EDA. That is okay. Um, that is not a quorum of the EDA but just wanted to bring to the council's attention that half of the EDA members are city council members, uh, are EDA members and nice jacket, Mr. Badeau, Mr. Mayor. And that's it, thank you. Thank you, or the council's doing, looks like the council's doing a hostile takeover of the EDA. We're just slowly getting more and more <laughs> members. Eventually they won't, they won't exist. That brings us to 10 planning commission, 10A Trinity's Children's Center CUP amendment, Mr. Jansky. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, this is the, to this last time, uh, CUP member from Trinity Tr Children's Center, if I can say that. Um, purpose of this amendment is that their initial, their original uh, CUP limited the number of their students to 35. Um, they've since gotten more than that. They are, they are looking to increase their student occupancy, uh, especially as we see an increased need for uh, child care, not just in our community, but actually throughout the country. Um, during the regular meeting on April 15th, the Planning Commission voted unanimously to approve the CUP amendment, uh, eliminating any occupancy restrictions and implementing the following conditions. First, hours of operation shall be no earlier than 7 a.m than 7 p.m. That's actually a mandate by the Department of Human Services, but wanted to keep that in there as well. Trinity Children's Center shall provide the city a copy of their current and, <laughs> and all future licenses as issued by the Minnesota Department of Human Services 
And then third, the approval of the approval of this conditional use permit is conditional on the rezoning of 1420 South 6th Street from R1 to B2. And that final reading is the next item on the agenda. Okay, looking for Jan. What do you have? No, I'll make I'll make a motion to okay. um, approve the uh, so conditional use permit with the uh, conditions that have been read in. Second. Motion by Lambert, a second by Bevins to approve the CUP amendment as stated by the Community Development Director. Any discussion? Seeing none, we'll vote by roll call. T. Erickson? Yes. Lambert? Yes. Junik? Yes. W. Erickson? Yes. Bevins? Yes. Ann Johnson? Yes, motion carries. Planning Commission 10B, final reading of proposed ordinance 1504 and ordinance to rezone property at 1420 South 6th Street from a R1 single family residential district to a B2 neighborhood business district. Mr. Chansky. Thank you, Mr. President. Again, this is the same property. Uh, property is actually owned by uh, Trinity Lutheran Church uh, that houses Trinity Children's Center as one of their ministries. Um, to make the Children Trinity Center CUP into compliance with the zoning code, they have requested a rezoning from R1 single family to B2 uh, neighborhood business district. Um, the Planning Commission recommended this uh, approval of this rezoning on April 20, and the City Council, um, I should say they did it on the 15th. The City Council read their first reading of this proposed ordinance during their regular meeting on the 20th. So today uh, we're looking to hold the final reading of the ordinance and then consider adopting the ordinance. Jan, do you have Mr. a motion? Chair? Yep. Yes, I do. I have a motion to dispense with the final reading of the proposed ordinance 1504. Second. A motion by Lambert, a second by Bevins to dispense with the final reading. Any discussion? Hearing none, we'll vote by roll. T. Erickson. Yes. Yes. W. Erickson? Yes. Evans? Yes. And Johnson? Yes. Motion carries. Jan, do you have another motion? Yes, I do. A motion to adapt the proposed ordinance 1504, um, an ordinance amending ordinance eight, number 812 pertaining to the zoning of the city of Brainerd for 1420 South 6th Street from R1 to B2. Second. I so move. We have a motion by Lambert and a close up second by Bevins. Is there any discussion? <laughs> Hearing none, we'll vote by roll call. T. Erickson. Yes. Lambert. Yes. Tunick. Yes. Bridget. Yes. W. Erickson. Yes. Bevins. Yes. And Johnson. Yes, that motion carries. And Trinity is now good to go, right? We should be done with that one. All right. Come here, chair. Well, that's your office, isn't it? You should already have a comfy chair there. I don't sit this long. <laughs> that's a sign of a working man. Okay, that that and that nice jacket. <laughs> Done with the planning commission, right? That brings us to 11 public forum. Anybody have anything to say to the council that was not already addressed or that is not on the agenda tonight? Teresa, you're the only member of the public here. I got nothing. Thank you. We'll close the public forum. That'll bring us to 12 staff reports. Any updates, Paul? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, this last week, um, we had some reports of some activity on the um, uh, Buffalo Hills Trail uh, on the dike that goes across the backwash ponds from BPU. Um, upon investigation, we found we have multiple muskrats digging underneath the uh, and uh, we have a beaver problem also. So. Um, I, I met out there with our street foreman, um, and we have some repair work that is going to need to be done on the trail. Uh, it includes about 250 feet of trail. It's going to have to be ripped up 
and we're going to have to probe and see where the voids are underneath the trail. Um, we found the ones we could with the loader by driving the loader over the top of the trail and um, caving it in and, and filling those in with class five for now. Um, but we really need to uh, take the pavement off the trail um, and poke in there and see if we can find any more. And so um, I, I estimate that with the 250 feet of trail that we have to take up, it's gonna be about um, 3,000 to 3,500 bucks to repave that. Um, and our city street department staff can do all the other work um, to prep that surface again. But uh, we really need to get that straightened out too, um, so that, that the public is safe to use the trail. So um, we'll be probably doing that work not next week, but the week after, once we're done street sweeping. I just wanted to make sure that the council was aware of that. So if they get calls about the trail being um, tore up in a few spots, that um, you know kind of what's going on. So what, what's the solution to the wildlife? Are you going to build like a tunnel under the trail and hope they use it, or what? certified beaver trapper and um and i think the season is open right now um and as far as muskrats are concerned we're going to talk with the dnr um conservation officer to see if we can get a nuisance permit to trap some of the um muskrats out of that area to protect our infrastructure through there so so the solution is to just kill them all well i mean they're causing a lot of damage which they tend to do <laughs> so Police Chief McQuiston's cat looks like it could take care of a muskrat or two. <laughs> Jan, do you have something? Yeah, I do have a question. Is this going to be an ongoing problem or eventually they're going to stop? I mean, is this going to be something we're going to have to do every day? Uh, is that it's going to be an ongoing um, If we talk to the conservation officer, we can usually just have an open um, trapping permit for that area um, as if they're causing nuisance conditions. Um, we okay. do have numerous areas in town that cause uh, beaver or there's numerous issues around town from beavers that we've had in previous years with plugging culverts and um, causing water okay. backups and things. So we'll probably have an open nuisance permit and I've instructed our street foreman Sean that he can go ahead and trap in those areas to um, relieve the nuisance on the trail. So. Thank you. David. Thanks, Paul. Mr. President, I just have three quick things. Uh, the Planning Commission is having a workshop this Wednesday, May 6th at 6 p.m. And then the EDA also has a meeting this Thursday, May 7th, also at 6 p.m. Again, just notice for the EDA, slight time change. Normally in the past, they've met at 7.30 a.m. They're going to meet at 6 6 p.m. on Thursday. Uh, information on how the public can participate in those meetings can be found on the city's website. And then finally, I just want to encourage people again, if you have not part uh, participated in the census to do so, you can do so at www.my2020census.gov. That's all I have, Mr. President. Oh, you got another one? Yeah, sorry, one more thing. Um, we did, um, uh, take Riverside on May 1st. Uh, Riverside Drive uh, is now a city street. With that, um, we had some um, some folks call in that the speed limit was dropped to 30 miles an hour. That is a statutory thing. So uh, the speed limit on Riverside Drive is now 30. Um, with the project coming next year um, and the payment we received from Crowan County, that will be getting restriped also. So um, not only will we be, um, you know, hopefully enforcing that 30 mile an hour speed zone through there where we see quite higher speeds because of the four lane, um, when it gets restriped, it should also help with the calming of traffic and uh, the incorporation of some bike lanes and things to improve pedestrian safety. So, yeah, that street makes a 66 on Washington Street look pedestrian. <laughs> Jennifer? <laughs> So I have two quick items. One, just want to keep you updated on the farmer's market. We have now reached out to four organizations, all who have declined to take the lead on it. Um, we are still moving forward and we hope to have something before the council on May 18th to consider. Um, right now, I think what we're looking at is maybe an option for our parks department to help coordinate this since they probably won't be doing programming this summer. 
So uh, Parks Director Saylor will be talking to the Park Board about the option to do that. We also have two interns that will be starting that could help support that as well. So stay tuned, you'll have more information on May 18th. Again, I'll just reinforce that uh, farmers markets are clearly exempt in the governor's stay at home order. And in fact, are being encouraged as long as you can safely follow the recommendations from the CDC. So uh, more information to come. Secondly, what I wanted to mention is uh, just talking about funding for programs. The EDA at their meeting on the 7th will be talking about uh, what kind of programs could potentially be created to help our business owners once they are uh, back up and running. So I would expect that after the EDA's discussion, you will have that also on the council agenda, and I'm sure that David will be following up on that. So you've heard enough from me tonight. And that's all I have unless anybody has questions. Mr. Chair, just regarding the, um, the farmer's market, we did discuss closing a street, and there was at least one downtown business that commented on that. Hopefully Jennifer or Tony, if Parks takes it, got that comment. Mr. Chair. So Alderman Bevins, thank you for saying that. We I have spoken now to several downtown businesses while the overwhelming number of them do support it. Uh, Bob and Franz has been adamantly um, opposed to Okay. And then also, I, I have reached out to a couple that I have not heard back from. So um, whether that ultimately is a recommendation or not, we're not sure. I think a couple of things that we're looking at, is there a parking lot that is bigger that potentially could be used? Is there another space? I know the intent of that farmer's market really was to try to get people downtown Brainerd and shopping at our stores in downtown Brainerd. So again, I think more to come on a recommendation. Thank you. Anything from Corky, Tony, Tony? No. Uh, mayor's report. Well, the mayor just wants to thank everybody for uh, the meeting tonight. I think it's going smoothly. Really appreciating uh, everyone's ability to operate their computers, Stunic especially. Congratulations. Uh, <laughs> other than that, not yourself. Thank you, Mayor. Then we're going to just go in order on my screen. So we'll start with Alderman Pritchett. I have nothing to report. Uh, Alderman Bevins. Nothing to add. Alderman Stunick. Nothing to add. Alderman Tatter. Uh, nothing to add. Alderman Wayne Erickson. Who knew to add anything? <laughs> well, maybe next time. <laughs> and Jan Lambert. Nothing to add, thank you. Okay, I do have two things to add. We're not getting out of here that quick. <laughs> Sorry, hiring committee met to we did we did uh, reduce our number of applicants down and we are doing interviews on May 27th. So we are hoping to have a job offer out after that and have an executive director in place in early June. And while the major league baseball is shut down, the South Korean baseball league is starting up tomorrow. They signed a deal with ESPN. They are going to have, we're going to have baseball games on ESPN. So just so you know, the LG twins start tonight at midnight. If you want a twins team to follow. It's just a FYI. With that, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Alderman Pritchett. I just wanted to say really quickly, I lied. I do have something to report. Uh, I think we can be extremely proud of how our staff is dealing with the COVID-19 emergency, the amount of work that they're putting in, the amount of consideration that they're giving residents, citizens, community, um, kudos to them. And I move to adjourn. Second, Lambert. A motion by Pritchett, a second by Lambert, and we'll vote by roll call. T. Erickson. Stunick. I suppose. <laughs> Pritchett? <laughs> yes. W. Erickson? I was told the meetings go to 10 o'clock. <laughs> you can stay on till then. <laughs> that may be a nay. And Johnson. Yes, that motion carries and we are a I skipped again. Well, what's Bevan's vote? Wow. Bevins. <laughs> Maybe we don't care, Kelly. I'm not voting. 
Kevin <laughs> Richards. Abstain. Abstain. That's what I was going to say. Abstain. <laughs> Never abstained ever. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye now. Thanks. Bye.